proclaim the land to be worthy of blessing, honor, and glory. We fall down before you in worship. Amen. We welcome Janet back, and we're so glad she's in good health so that she can be with us today. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's like I didn't even have it because of all your prayers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Today is communion. If you haven't picked up your elements, um, we'll make sure you have them. Everyone has them. There's only ones in the back now, so if anyone comes in. Um, today is also the first Sunday of the month. And it's usually birthday celebration Sunday for those with birthdays in May and anniversaries in May. But I understand there's not going to be cake. There's going to be something else. So join us for celebration at fellowship time after worship. Uh, speaking of celebrating, um, I know Fran and Kirk are probably with us online. And it certainly is time to celebrate Fran's good news that um, she is treatment and cancer free. So blessings to you. Fran, and we are hoping to see you here in person very soon. So Sally, can we dedicate the bells that rang to Jesus and to Fran? It's wonderful because she rang the bell, which is significant uh, finishing treatment. Um, so it's very celebratory. I indeed will dedicate that. Also, thinking of celebrating and bells, celebration needs to go to Tracy. Yes. Because Tracy did her recital as part of her doctoral program. And I had the opportunity to watch it on YouTube. And Tracy, it was so impressive, so impressive. The different Tracy here and the different Tracy in recital, unbelievable. Tracy was outstanding. <laughs> I'm sure you know, to watch um, her two pieces she played. Um, you can get the YouTube link from her. I'm sure she can really I, I sent it by email to everybody, so you should have received. Um, in your insert, there are a number of reminders. If you have not renewed your Amazon Smiles or your Card Rewards, please do that. Uh, session is meeting May 12th at 6.45, a little change in time. Confirmation class resumes today. Um, and also in your insert, you'll see that the Sunday School class is beginning a new study on the different resurrection formats, and that will be beginning next Sunday at 9.30. So bring your favorite Bible and a journal. For the different accounts of the resurrection. Also, uh, the National Day of Prayer and Bible Study is this week, beginning Wednesday, 5 p.m., and continuing to Thursday, May 5th, 5 p.m., at the gazebo on Main Street, just a little south of the railroad tracks. It will be continuous prayer and Bible reading. Um, although it is spearheaded by Thrive Village Christian Church, I'm hoping our church will have good representation there as you sign up for 30 minute slots. And they're hoping that um, the entire New Testament will be read in maybe 18 to 21 hours. So if you can sign up for a slot, and um, Linda has to be here, but slots are still available, and I'll put it in the fellowship hall um, so that we can participate in that. And if you want to do it with a friend, one could be praying, one could be reading the Bible, but um, the entire New Testament in 18 to 21 hours is pretty impressive uh, to spread God's word, so think about that. Uh, all the hymns this morning are from the Burgundy hymn book. And so if there are no other announcements. So um, let us remember the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all keep silence before him as we listen to it.
so good when I heard how many people were praying and little things, some show up in the mail, some show up at my door, but most of all your prayers showing up for me to be fully healed. Welcome to all who are here today and those who are online. We are here to worship, of course, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we continue in this season of Easter, so we stand and do our call to worship. Let us stand. Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen today. Alleluia! And we're going to be singing him 250, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Christ came for our forgiveness. We must just uh, confess with our mouths to receive his forgiveness. So in unison we pray. Thank you, Jesus, for visible signs of invisible grace through the sacraments of baptism and communion. These sacraments are signs and seals of your word and truth, and yet we struggle to find peace. Forgive us for not trusting you at your word, Jesus, for you are the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And hear the assurance of forgiveness as Jesus died upon the cross for us. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. We are gathered here to hear the word that God has for us today. Let us call out in unison and ask for God's word. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? And yet it is impossible for us to understand without the light of the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word. And so we pray in unison. Lord, through your spirit, enable us to consider your word and to enact it in our lives to bring you glory and praise. Amen. Please be seated. Sally already mentioned we're on our third Sunday of Easter because Easter is not a day, it's a season. In fact, it's a way of life. 
We are resurrection people. And so we are going through every single resurrect and resurrection account. We'll be doing so in Sunday school starting next week. But now in the book of Luke, we're going through all the passages in Luke. And so far, we're on our third resurrection passage, all of which happen on the very first day of the resurrection. But before I read, I have a question for you. Have any of you ever been out and about and you've run into somebody and you think you might know them because you don't know them very well, they're just an acquaintance, you don't see them very often, or you're running into them in an unexpected place, you don't recognize them? Has that ever happened? That happened to me just a few weeks ago. Of course, we're, we were having to wear masks because we were in a senior residence, but I ran into um, Dawn Rice, the Crawford's daughter, and I didn't expect to see her at the Inn at Summit Trail when I was visiting John Davis on a Saturday, but there she was sitting at the front desk, and I almost didn't recognize her because I did not expect to see her. I don't get to see her very often. So I think that happens to all of us. We're going to hear of a similar event happening in the scripture today but it's not quite the same. Now the account that we're gonna hear in the scripture only occurs in the book of Luke. And it is the first account where Jesus actually makes an appearance. The first two accounts, the ones we heard on the first Sunday of Easter and second, he had not yet appeared. We had just heard of his appearance through the women and the men who went to the tomb to check it out. But today, he'll be encountered. So listen to the reading on page 1507. Please open to read along with me. We'll be stopping along the way on the road to Emmaus. And we're beginning at chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Do you get that? Do you hear that? That's similar to what we might encounter. They didn't recognize him, even though he was right there with him. Now, their situation's a little different than ours, and we're going to unpack that as we read along. So verses 17 we're picking up with. He, that is Jesus, asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Stop there for a second. That might be a hint to us why they didn't recognize him. Their condition was that they were downcast. They were sad. And not only was their face, but that reflected a condition of their heart. Their hearts were downcast. Their hearts were sad. And so that might be why they didn't recognize him. We'll pick up on this a little further on to see if this is true. It continues in verse 18. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So stop there. This converges with the idea of their faces being downcast. Do you notice they're talking in the past tense now? He was a prophet. And we had hoped. That is to say, hope is lost. We're not hoping anymore. We've lost all hope. We're downcast. We're sad. It is the third day. We had heard that he would rise on this third day, but so far no one has seen him. Hope is lost. We're sad. Our hearts are downcast and have no hope. That could be why they didn't see him. 
Let's continue on in verse 22. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. There's that memory of those first two accounts that we heard on the first and second Sunday. The women went to the tomb. They saw the vision of angels. They came back, but they didn't see Jesus. The companions ran back. That is Peter, John, and perhaps James ran back to see if what the women said was true, but they didn't see the angels or Jesus either. But here they are now hearing this story from Jesus himself and talking to Jesus about the very events that Jesus was the center of. Now, we started out by asking the questions, are there ever times where you're out and about and you may see someone you don't know very well? And you don't expect to see them, and that's why you didn't recognize them. So we might say, well, maybe that was really the reason. We've never heard of Cleopas before. Have you? This is the only account that we've probably heard his name in, but here's the problem. Cleopas knew Jesus very well. Let me explain to you who Cleopas is. When it's mentioned that some of our women amazed us, that woman, that word, our women, Cleopas is saying, some of our women, one of whom was my wife, the third woman who went to the tomb uh, that came back and talked to the disciples, along with Mary Magdalene, always mentioned, and Joanna, that we didn't talk about yet, is Mary, the mother of James, James the younger, not James the brother of John, the fisherman. James the Younger. There are two Jameses who are disciples. Well, Mary, the mother of James, is also Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the wife of Cleopas, also called Alphaeus. So sometimes when we see James the Younger's name mentioned, it says James, the son of, a, of Alphaeus. So, point is, James and Mary definitely know Jesus well. James is one of the disciples that has been with him for three years. Mary, the mother of James, is one of the women who traveled with the disciples and helped them as they went from place to place. But you might say, well, maybe Cleopas wasn't with them. Maybe he didn't know them. But listen to the name of his other child. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. No, this isn't Joseph, the father of Jesus. But Cleopas is the brother of Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus. Cleopas has known Jesus his entire life. And in fact, before he was even born, through his brother, who would have told him about the angel coming and talking about Mary bearing the child, the, the woman who he was engaged to be married to. This is someone that knows him very, very, very well. He probably heard the whole story of Jesus' life. In fact, this road to Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, Jesus would go every year to Passover. Remember how he would stop in Bethany to visit his other relatives, his mother's relatives, John and Zachariah and Elizabeth? Well, this is his father's side of the family. While he was in Jerusalem, he probably went to visit them too. So he had probably walked this Emmaus road many times before, as did Cleopas, because this is where he lives. In fact, they might have walked it together. Because when Joseph's Joseph, his stepfather, died, the uncle of your father who died would often take the place of your father. Jesus still was a young man when his father died. He needed a father figure, and Cleopas was probably that to him. They probably walked this road together. So... Is there any excuse for Cleopas not recognizing Jesus just because he didn't know him well? 
He knew them by heart. They were part of the same family, a family filled with love. He knew him very, very well. But the point is that his heart wasn't prepared to receive and recognize Jesus that day. His heart was downcast. His heart was sad. His heart had lost all hope. So has it ever happened to us that we show up, perhaps at church, and we think, oh, I want to encounter Jesus today. Well, I didn't like those songs very much. I sure didn't find Jesus there. Or, wait a minute, I didn't like that scripture reading or that sermon. But you see, when we come with our hearts ready to receive, wanting to receive Jesus, we will recognize him. No matter what songs are sung, no matter what scriptures are read, no matter who's standing in the pulpit, because it's Jesus. And let's see if that makes any sense in the rest of the context of this passage. So, they did not see Jesus. Then we have verse 25. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus was talking about himself, and they still don't recognize him. And then it goes on. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Then at verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. So here goes Jesus walking down a road he's walked down many times, and he goes in with them to a house sitting at a table that he's probably sat at many times to be with his family, to share meals with them with hearts of love and openness. And he sits at the table. Now, isn't it strange, though? This is not Jesus' house. This is Cleopas's house. Cleopas is the host of the house. Shouldn't it be he's the one who says the grace and takes the bread and gives thanks and breaks it and gives it? So why did it happen in this way? You know why. I don't have to tell you why. Because Jesus was doing this in remembrance. He was portraying the Last Supper. That last Passover meal that they took together, where Cleopas and Mary and the younger James and others who were with him were probably there. And they... Then, when he took these actions that he took at the night of his arrest, it says in verse 31, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. So they didn't recognize him, and now all of a sudden they do. Why? Because they're sitting at the family table of God. At the table that Christ prepared. As a way of remembering and recognizing him. Now, do you see anything different about the table this week for communion as it has been in the past? I want to give thanks to our youth. We're doing confirmation class. And they came in a few weeks ago and I welcomed them to walk around the sanctuary and to ask all kinds of questions. Sally was there when, when they were doing this. She remembers that day. They were very inquisitive. <laughs> and one of the things that was noticed is the beautiful words carved in the wood on our table. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, we've been in a habit of covering those words with the tablecloth. And I said, can we... Can we leave the tablecloth off or pull it back in such a way that we'll be able to see all those words? Why? Because communion is remembering Jesus' words and actions, just like what happened here on the road to Emmaus. So every communion time from now on, we're going to see those words. We're going to remember those words. 
We're going to let those words speak to our hearts. Let our hearts be warmed. What happens next in the passage is this. He disappeared from their sight, and then verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. This doesn't mean they had indigestion. Their hearts burning is like the words that were spoken by John Wesley, the leader of the Methodist church. This is what he said. When he goes into service, when he listens for the word of God, God, he knows that Jesus is present when his heart is strangely warmed. So when we come to gather together to hear God's word, isn't that what you hope for? Don't you want your hearts to be warmed, filled with his love, to know his presence, to know Jesus by heart? Isn't that your hope? Isn't it what we all want? It's what they wanted, and when they finally realized, not just at the table, but even before, just at the speaking of the scriptures, they recognized their hearts were warmed by Jesus and the scriptures and his words. For weeks now, since September, the intercessory prayer team has been praying through this book. It's the Ignatian Exercises, which were, were written back at the time of the Reformation, when Calvin and Luther and Ignatius were looking for reforming the church. And they would all ascribe to daily scripture reading. So every day, the intercessory prayer team reads scripture. And sometimes, at the end of the scripture readings, there's other inspirational things that are written down for us. And I don't think there was any coincidence of the timing of these inspirations. Right after the scriptures on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it has the words of an early church father that seem fairly similar to the words of Emmaus and the words of Wesley. Augustine wrote this, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Sometimes we cannot recognize Jesus or pick up on him when we hear scripture readings or when we hear certain songs because our hearts are restless. They may be sad or full of angst. And right next to this, there's a poem, which I've never, I never had heard before, written by a Nobel Prize of Literature winner in 1913, an Indian poet named Tagore, who was a friend of Gandhi, but he was a Christian. Listen to this poem. Pray it with me, would you? A prayer to God, giving over our hearts. Let your love play upon my voice and rest on my silence. Let it pass through my heart into all my movements. Let your love, like stars, shine in the darkness of my sleep and dawn in my awakening. Let it burn 
and the flame of my desires and flow in all the currents of my own love. Let me carry your love in my life as a harp does its music and give it back to you at last with my life. Amen. May the love of God fill your heart. May the love of God give you rest, bring you joy, let you recognize him. May the eyes of your heart be opened to recognize Jesus. Every time you seek him, may he be found. In Jesus' name, amen. And because we want to see Jesus, let us stand and sing him 442. Here, O oh my Lord, I see thee face to face. Please be seated. With our hearts open and ready, we are invited to the table that Christ has set for us. He has invited us to this table as part of his family, and we are here. As I was preparing today for worship, I was remembering the great Thanksgiving in its traditional form that I remembered from growing up. Now, it's done in the Catholic Church, but it's also in the Protestant Church, too. This is part of our Book of Common Worship. And from here on in, I'll be including this at the beginning. And you may know these responsive reading, and if not, I'll teach it to you. And then from here on in, we'll print it in the bulletins. I say this and then you respond. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks 
and praise. It is surely right, O oh Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit, to give our thanks and praise, for without you we would have nothing. You are the creator of all good things, the giver of all good things, the sustainer of all good things. Father, we thank you that you have sent your son, the best of all. Sent your son for your good and for your will, but also for the good of your church, for those who love you. And we are so grateful for all that you, Father, did in sending your son and all Jesus you did in coming to die upon the cross. There was nothing that seemed good that happened to you that day. You suffered pain. You shed blood. You gave up your body. You didn't do this for you. You did this for the Father's will. You did this for us. For us to be cleansed of our sin, to be forgiven, and for nothing to ever be held against us again. You said upon the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, and we don't. And that is why, Jesus, you also sent so we would not be orphaned and alone. Though you are now with the Father at, in, at the right hand in heaven, and you are not here on earth, you, Holy Spirit, are sent by Jesus to live in our hearts, our hearts. You are the one who touches our hearts. You are the one who warms our hearts. You are the one who transforms our hearts so that we can be changed into your nature and character, that we can carry your love, your joy, and your peace. You, Holy Spirit, are the one that help us to understand that in Scripture we see Jesus through Scripture. You reveal him to us. You are the one that helps us to pray, just as Jesus taught us to pray. And in compassion still prays for us and intercedes with us now for all that have need. Hear the prayers of your people. Lord, we lift up prayers for the church. Prayers that the heart of the church will be revived and will beat in full. We lift up prayers for the nation and for all nations and for the leaders that guide them. Hear the prayers spoken in our hearts now. We lift up prayers for nations under siege that suffer violence even at the hand of their own leaders. Hear these prayers spoken in our hearts. We lift up prayers for nations that do not know you and therefore cannot recognize you. Come to them, O Lord, Send them ones who love you so that they might hear the good news. Hear these prayers spoken in our hearts. We lift themselves, we lift up prayers for those who put themselves in harm's way to protect others. Hear prayers for them spoken in our hearts. We lift up prayers for sufferers of violence, worldly violence and natural disasters and human trafficking, those who suffer the violence of death and who are in grief. Hear the prayers for them spoken in our hearts. We lift up prayers for those who suffer in their own minds, mental illness, 
anxiety, depression, cognitive issues. We think of these and lift up prayers for them in our own hearts. We lift up prayers for those who have serious health conditions and chronic health situations, especially for our homebound members who cannot be with us. We pray that they'll know that they're always part of this body and that they're never alone. We pray for them in our hearts. We lift up prayers for caregivers of those who are sufferers of illness and disease, who have special needs or other chronic conditions. We pray for them in our hearts. We lift up prayers for those who suffer with cancer, which is not of you, and we pray for these in our hearts. We lift up prayers for those who suffer conditions of their bones, their tendons, their joints, and we pray for them in, their, in our hearts. We lift up prayers for those who have health conditions of their hearts and ask for you to be with them and mend those and pray for them in our hearts. We lift up prayers for those who suffer condition in other organs such as kidneys, liver, and all others, we pray for those in our hearts. We lift up prayers for those who have failing eyesight and hearing and mobility issues. And we pray for them in our hearts. We lift a special prayer today for Karen Stotts, mother of Laura Miller, taken to the hospital having just suffered a stroke. We pray for all the people who come to our hearts and mind, O oh Lord, as you would ask us to do through your spirit. And we pray because you are the one who has taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just as was described in the passage today, at the time before, on the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Take it and eat it and do it in remembrance of me.
In the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. And it is my blood that has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take it and drink it. And likewise, do it in remembrance of me. The body of Christ for the people of God. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ poured out in love for you. Take and drink. Let us thank God for all that he has done for us in this meal and this time together. Jesus, if the world would come in here and look at this table, it looks scant to them. Like there isn't much at all. But this is a sign of all that you have done for us. A visible sign of invisible grace. And though it may look small, what you did for us and continue to do in your love is so great and so good. It is eternal and it has no end. Let us take this to heart and remember this all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. And because all that Christ has done for us, it should be just a very small thing when we give anything back to him in the way of serving and in the way of giving of resources. There are receptacles at each exits of the church. Please consider giving in thankfulness to our Lord Jesus who has done so much. Consider this in your hearts as we hear the offertory played by Tracy. Jesus, you lived your life dedicating everything that you did, everything that you said, everything that you thought to the Father in heaven. We dedicate our offerings to you and offer our very selves and ask that they be consecrated for your purpose and your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And on this Sunday of communion, we ask as our affirmation of faith that we speak in unison the Nicene Creed written for communion. Together we say, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our closing hymn is 437, tuned one, the church's one foundation. Just the reminder for the confirmation class to meet with me after. And AJ, you get to be with us today. Okay. Yes, really. Yay. Well, hey, everybody else, you can join us too if it makes you that happy. Okay. <laughs> so um, I just want to say, go with your hearts full of love and joy to go and serve the Lord and to be in confirmation class. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>